Right. Most websites are going to be basic business websites. So if you are a plumber and you want a basic business website to advertise your services, how many pages might you require for that? So how many pages would you think you would need for a basic plumbing website? You could possibly get away with two. There's a plumber I deal with, they just <coughs> one big page, one large page, beautifully designed, and it's split off into different areas, you know, plumbing, heating, contact us, it's got all that. But most people will, you know, when you talk about a basic business website, you probably talk about four or five pages generally. So having, you know that now, you know you've got four pages to build, four or five pages to build, what other things do you now need to take into account? What, what else do you need to know before you can start building? Yep, so you need to define, do you remember what we did last week, how we, did, we talked about a structure diagram, how the pages are going to link together. So you would need, you need to know how many pages you want and what's the subject of each page. What else do you need to know before you can go any further? What is this process, this process of requirement from, from initially talking to your client to get to the point where you can start building, what are those processes? Information and subject. Yeah, information, you need to know, I'm not a plumber. So if somebody comes to me and says, I want you to build me a website all about plumbing, I know nothing about plumbing. It's like, I think the example I gave you last week was the wine merchant who came and asked me to build him a website. Well, I know nothing about wine. The only thing I know about wine is if you drink too much, you fall over. Or, you know, I don't know anything about grapes, I don't know about the regions. Yeah, yes, I've heard things and I can see on labels where it tells me where it's come from, but essentially my, my knowledge of wine is zilch. So, you have to do a bit of research. You need to get into the subject. Yeah, I'm Mr. Ross. Yeah, we'll need to get it for nine, please. But um, essentially, you need to start researching and researching well about the subject that you're building, about, you know, the site, what the site is about. You need to know about the person you're building it for or the company you're building it for uh, because you're going to be putting some kind of company bio. You know, so it's, it's all these things that you need to get into the subject, but once you've done that then, you've, you've defined the site's purpose to advertise the business. You've, designed, you've defined the site's subject, it's about plumbing. What else do you then need to do? What do you need to know after that? What I'm talking about here is pretty basic stuff, the, the next thing you need to know. Um, what colour are you going to make it? <laughs> So what colour scheme? Are there any corporate colours? Does the company have a logo? Can you incorporate that logo into the scheme? All, all that kind of stuff. Because you're trying to create... If you think about all businesses, when they're doing advertising materials, whether it's their own paperwork, they'll probably have a logo of some kind. They'll have a, a corporate colour that they use. So you will have to try and carry that through to the website to keep everything branded the same. So you're looking at those kind of things. Copyright. That's when... Sorry? Copywriting. Yeah, if they've got photos, are they original photos? Are they wanting to use something from somewhere else? If, you, if you're the web designer and you want to use pictures from somewhere else, then it's your responsibility to find out, either to write to whoever, to whoever's images you want to use, ask if you can use them and gain permission. Alternative, or alternatively, you could be breaking copyright rules. So there's lots of things you have to do before you can even get to the stage of starting to build. So what stage were we at last week when we started? I'll give you a folder if you remember, with some files in. Um, and we've got one particular type of file there that we followed as our template. Can you remember what I called that piece of that document? Um, mock-up? Sorry? Is it a mock-up? Um, the whole thing is a mock-up because it, it wasn't a real website. It's just an exercise I gave you to do. But there was, we followed a diagram. If you remember, I, I gave you a wireframe. That's the one I'm looking for, wireframe. It's a wireframe diagram. And we said that if you, once you've produced your wireframe, that tells you how you're going to lay the page out, how many columns, how many rows, and all that sort of stuff. Then we go on to the stuff that's on the board, if you remember. We've produced a wireframe, and I showed you those images at the top right hand side there which are what we call visuals. So you, you practice with the colour scheme based on the framework that you've chosen or the wireframe that you've chosen. You practice with the colour scheme 
And at that point, once you've got your visuals and your wireframes, you're, you're at the point when you can then go back to your client and say, this is how we plan to build your site. And then at that point, the client can put all their input into it and talk about, well, I don't like that colour. Can you change that for something else? Or I don't like that text. I don't like that font. So this is where you negotiate with the client. This is what we plan to build. Does this fit in with your plans? And then you negotiate with your client until you get something that does fit in with, your, with, the, with the plans and everybody's happy, then you can start building. That's what requirements is all about. You find out what your customer wants and then you refine it down <coughs> to exactly what it is you plan to build. But you have to have sign off from the client to say, yes, I'm happy with what you're gonna build from me. Once they say they're happy, then you can kick into the build. And even at that stage, when you start building, you can still talk to your client. This is what we've got so far, what do you think of it? And if you do that, that regular communication, then everybody seems to, you know, everybody stays happy. If you just sort of take these requirements, go away, build something, then go back to the client and show them something, they're not forced to like it. You know, they'll, if, if you keep consulting all the way through the process, then you generally get a good, a good result. If you don't consult, then obviously things go wrong because people misinterpret the instructions. So that's basically what requirements is all about. It's finding out what's wanted, talking to the client, and then you can get onto the build side of it. Okay, anybody, anything you'd like to ask on that or anything you'd like to bring into this? Because not all builds are the same, obviously. There are different levels of requirement. If somebody wants a really heavy, heavily functional site, so, you know, something that's programmed as well as just done in HTML, then you might do it differently because you need to discuss and nail down exactly what the function is. Okay, I'm going to hold it at that because this was really just basically in the form of a recap. Um, what we're going to do now then is carry on from where we left off last week. We're going to go back into the practical build and start working on these languages. Before we do that, <coughs> Did I talk to you last week in regard to what I call the layered approach for web design? Does anybody remember that at all? If you don't remember it, it may be because I didn't go through it. Because I, I, I work, I'm currently working with four different BTEC groups, and on some I've done this, and on some I haven't. I, can't, and I, didn't, I don't think yours was one of them. I just want to explain this concept. You'll find a document on Interact called, you know, uh, the layered approach to web design, and that's that's the only thing I really want to introduce today. Not masses of new material in terms of um, delivered content. Most of what I want us to do today is going to be practical. But I just want to show you this thing: the way web design used to work, when you built an HTML page, generally using HTML4 or XHTML1. In the early days, it used to be the case that if I wanted a head in there that said welcome, I would insert that head in there using code, which would be, somebody tell me what a heading is. I don't think I've actually gone through this with you, but anybody know the H1 tag? We might put the head in, which would say welcome, but we would have to style it on the page. If I wanted that heading to be red and of a certain font size, I would have to say within this H1 tag, font equals and size equals. So all the styling would be on the, in the actual HTML code itself. We no longer do that. And you saw evidence of this last week. We take what we call a layer approach now. This layer containing the HTML we refer to as the structural layer. This is the one that actually lays out the page and defines its structure. The second layer is what we call the presentational layer. What might this one be? If the structure is in HTML, what's going to decide how the page looks? It's the CSS, which stands for. Cascading It does. The third layer, 
which isn't always used, but frequently is, is what we call the functional. or behavioural. So it's either the functional or behavioural layer. Okay, does anybody know what, what we might use for that? If we use HTML for structure, CSS for presentation, how do we add extra function into a page? JavaScript. Yes. So this is a programming language. Um, this is this is what you would refer to as a client-side language as opposed to a server-side language, and we'll go into that deeply later. Not today, but in a couple of weeks' time. We'll examine the difference between client-side programming and server-side programming. Um, I'll be giving you an assignment in about two to three weeks' time, and this will be in it. So I will deal with it before I give you the assignment. So we've got this three-layered approach. We put our structure down first in HTML. We put our build our presentational to tell that how to display. And if we want to add function in, things like displaying the date or um, making a different mouse cursor or various other, various other things we can do with it, we use JavaScript to add that function in. So that's what we call the layered approach to web design. And it's important, more important now than it's ever been. Especially with HTML5. So you will find a document on Interact which tells you all about this, but it's something you need to know. <coughs> Anybody got any questions in relation to this, this layered approach, and how it might... Why, why might this be more efficient than putting everything into the page, and putting all the structure into the page, all the function into the page? Why might this be a more efficient way of doing it? It's easy to change things. It is. The fact is you might have a six page website, say. So if you've got a six page website, and every one, every page has got an H1 tag on it, if you've done every page individually, and styled every page individually, and you want to change all those H1 tags, you've got to go and edit every single page. However, if you've got six pages all containing an H1, and its presentation is defined here, if you change that, it will update all six pages simultaneously. Because any changes you make there change how that appears. So this is the importance of using CSS because you can base all of your pages on one CSS file. Therefore, changes made there affect all six pages. So it just makes the whole thing much easier to administer. You can control the whole website just from that CSS document. The other thing, of course, is exactly the same situation with JavaScript. If you want to display the date on every page, you would have to embed the JavaScript code in every page. If you keep your, your JavaScript separate and just put a reference to that JavaScript file, include it, you know, then when you change that, it, again, it will update every page. So it's a matter of good, good management. It enables you to manage your website much better. And it makes that document much smaller by not having all of the code bed embedded into it. So each page is smaller. Your user, if, if, if you've got a 30 page site, say, every time your user visits another page, or what we call a visit, they have to download that page, don't they? They actually download that page to their machine to see it. If all your code is all your styling code is embedded in that page, you have to download all that styling code as well. If you've got a CSS, they've only got to download that sheet once for all 30 pages, because all the styling code is in that one document. So as long as they download that with the first page, every other subsequent page that comes down is only HTML, still relies on the same style sheet. So it's a much more efficient way. It's better for your visitors. It's better for the management of the site, so it's just a better system altogether. Do you put the page number in the CSS? Do you put the what, sorry? The page number in the CSS it refers to. No, you don't need to. What you do, <coughs> if that's an H1 tag, mm -hmm. then you make one rule for H1 in this. And every page, as long as this is linked to every page, every page that's got an H1, it will be styled this way. No, I mean if you have different pages styled, if you, do you have multiple CSS if you have different pages styled in different 
in general, well, let's just say you've got two different layouts, yeah. So, this, so the layout of this one is header, three columns, footer, but you've got another page which has header and then just one column and a footer. No, what you would do, you'd, you'd put the rules for the three in the style sheet, but you'd create a separate style for this bit. So you'd, you'd create a style called full width or something, which would apply to that one. So, but, but the rules would still be in the same style sheet. You can do multiple style sheets. Well, sorry, now what I mean is how, how does it go to find that page? Is it a page count or something? Uh, no, because if you, any style sheet that's attached to any page will automatically be applied to it. We, we will actually do this. We, we'll create two different layouts using one style sheet. And, but the page, by virtue of the fact that that page um, has the style sheet linked to it, it knows it's got to take all styling from that, that style sheet. So that one style sheet will apply to any by default that it's attached to. And you just define a different layout within that same style sheet. Uh, what, were you saying how does the page know that it's got to be different to the others? Yeah. Right, by different, different HTML code. But that HTML code is still styled by the same CSS document. We'll, we'll do it. I'll show you. I'll demonstrate it. Right, OK. So what we need to be doing now then, we're going to... Um, oh, just before we finish. This method, by the way, as well as being called the sort of layered approach, has a name. And you'll need to tell me this name in your assignment. What we call this is the separation... of concerns. In other words, that is concerned with structure, that is concerned with presentation, that is concerned with function, and we separate those things out in separate documents. So that's all that means, separation of concerns, but it's a very important term in modern web. Okay, so we'll end that bit at this point. <laughs>